Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. China and the Communist Party of China present themselves as a force for communism, a force against American imperialism, against Western hegemony. But is China really communist? To help us answer this question, we have Daniel Morley, who is a writer and editor for Socialist.net and a member of Socialist Appeal, the British section of the international Marxist tendency. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi. So, what are some of the accomplishments of the Chinese revolution? Why is it that even decades later, it continues to inspire? Yeah, well, despite the way in which it's presented by our media, the Chinese revolution in 1949 is one of the greatest events in history. This is the largest country in the world uh, with an incredible history. But for about 100 years prior to that revolution, China had been uh, oppressed uh, brutally by imperialism, particularly by British imperialism, humiliated. It still affects their consciousness today. And, you know, the, the, the country was looted by British imperialism. There were parts of the country that uh, local Chinese people weren't even allowed to go in. And then in 1949, after decades of the most epic struggle, the Communist Party swept to power from the countryside uh, and um, kicked out imperialism and essentially rebuilt the country. And, you know, the power, the strength of China today to a large extent, is down to that event, which, as I said, freed China from the domination of, well, by that time, uh, it was dominated more by American imperialism. And, you know, from that point onwards, the country was rebuilt uh, and some amazing achievements took place. For example, you know, uh, the workers' rights were, were granted. Um, uh, you know, there was uh, a, a really significant increase in wages and a shortening of working hours. The, uh, the economy grew at an average rate of about 11% a year from 1949 to 1957. And between 1957 and 1970, industrial production continued to grow at a rate of 9%. Uh, whereas India's growth rate, which is a comparable country, uh, was less than half that of China's at the same time. Yeah, comparable in so far as it's also a very large country, a very ancient country, but dominated by imperialism, dominated by colonialism, but a country where there was not a successful yes. revolution. But it had also, at least on paper, freed itself from the domination of imperialism in 1947. But not right? from capitalism. No. Um, so, you know, that's that's a very useful uh, comparison. Uh, you know, women were liberated uh, in, a, in a very uh, profound and thoroughgoing way. Foot binding, for example, was abolished. You know, uh, genuine equality in all matters, for example, uh, in terms of marriage, uh, was granted. Uh, wages rose by a third. Life expectancy rose from 36 to 57 in only eight years. And in 1970, it had reached the age of 70, which was similar at that time to advanced capitalist countries. Uh, ch the number of children in school doubled um, and housing uh, really improved significantly. There was a big program of house building, of social housing for, for workers. Um, uh, casual labor was ended. Um, so, you know, and of course the peasants were granted land. You know, we could go on, but th these are real achievements, which of course you never hear about over here or in, in our press. You only hear about you know um, about Mao being a bloodthirsty tyrant and all this sort of this typical stuff. Well, can we talk about Mao? Because as you say, the way that he's usually depicted in the West is as a bloodthirsty mass murderer who trampled over the bones of millions of Chinese people. But to some, particularly those who identify with communism, he's regarded as a hero. He's regarded as an inspiration. What is our attitude? What's the attitude of uh, communists, the communists of the international Marxist tendency towards Mao Zedong? Well, again, you know, Mao achieved incredible things. He led that revolution and he led the civil war uh, against uh, the Guomindang, the unbelievably corrupt uh, government that was backed up and armed to the teeth by the United States. 
And they fought heroically in the countryside literally for decades and uh, with incredible kind of tactical genius on the part of Mao, you know, brilliant uh, guerrilla warfare, for example. Uh, but at the same time, we have to say that Mao was not a Marxist theoretician. He had never really shown any interest in that side of Marxism, which is, to be honest, the fundamental, the key aspect of Marxism. In fact, he never really read any Marxist theory in any significant way until his late 30s. That wasn't entirely his fault. It was also the lack of it uh, within China, lack of translations into Chinese. Uh, but others did, you know, did manage to get their hands on some. And I think his attitude towards Marxist theory was that it was a tool, uh, really. It was something that he, you, know, you used to get what you wanted and you sort of changed as, as was useful to you. Um, and uh, also his strategy for, you know, he celebrated for his strategy and understandably so, as I said, I mean, the, the, they did actually succeed with this, i.e. with this sort of peasant warfare strategy. But that is, of course, very unusual and it's not what, you know, Marxists have ever uh, seen as really a viable way of building communism or, or of taking power. That was, and also it has to be said, that was not, as I said, he was not very interested in theory. And this was not a sort of theoretical development on his part. It's not as if he, he looked at everything and he realized, well, look, China's a different country. We need to have a different approach to revolution, i.e. a rural one. That's not actually the case. This was something that they sort of, a policy which they kind of accidentally fell into for complex reasons in terms of the, the like the failure of the earlier revolution in the 1920s and the the fallout from that they they just were hiding in the countryside and they essentially adapted uh, to that over time mm. and that meant that that yes okay it's true that that did succeed they did take power which we you know marxists would not generally expect to be possible uh, but to take power from from a kind of rural struggle there are very specific reasons why it did succeed, most notably the Second World War and the chaos that that created. Yeah, if you carry out revolution in that way, i.e., not from an urban working class uh, revolution, led you know led by the working class with their own you know with strikes and their you know their own workers' organisations, etc., but from the countryside, what does that mean? It means it's carried out by a military structure, a, com a top-down commandist structure, armed to the teeth very independent from the working class. The working class had no real connection to this and it couldn't have done because it was in the countryside for 20 years, you know, constantly on the march. So this, this the Red Army, you know, the People's Liberation Army was uh, very independent of the class forces it was supposed to be representing and liberating. And the, it, um, that meant that when it, once it was in power, it was it was always set up as a top down uh, bureaucratic kind of uh, dictatorship over the working class. Working class largely supported it and and welcomed a change in the regime. And of course, it welcomed the the real advances that were made. Uh, but it didn't have any control over such an organization. Didn't have its own democratic structures. That that revolution and that party was not a product of its own activity. And as a result, from that point onwards, the the Chinese Communist Party and, and the regime that they established was always a. There was never any workers' democracy within it. It was always bureaucratically controlled from above. Mm. And we'll have to return to the. Chinese Revolution and its aftermath in future episodes because it's such an amazing, inspiring and complicated story. And of course, we're not for a second saying that the Chinese Revolution was, was perfect and you explained why the regime that emerged was ultimately deformed and why socialism was never really attained in China despite all the advancements. But we're mostly here to talk about China today and to answer the question of whether China is communist. And I suppose if we're going to answer that question, the first thing we have to do is to define what communism is. So what actually is communism and what would it mean for China to be a communist society? Yeah, that's a very important question. Marx understood communism to mean the state at which the classes have disappeared and the state has withered away. There is no state under communism because there are no classes to repress. That, after all, is the purpose of the state, is to repress 
uh, 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 one class by another class. But if you have no classes, if class distinctions have disappeared, if poverty, if all, you know, all of the injustices of, of class society have, have disappeared, and if there's an abundance, a superabundance of all of the necessaries of life, and if you know the working class, or in fact there isn't even really a working class anymore, if society genuinely, consciously controls its own productive activity to meet need, the needs of all of society, and it can do so with the technology, modern technology available. If all of that happens, there's no uh, need for a state apparatus. Uh, and you have a situation that Marx described as uh, from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs. In other words, people are not working to get a wage, and they're not trying to sort of fight to climb the ladder and get a bigger income or status. Instead, they just work, as Marx said, he said, work would be life's prime want. In other words, work would be a, a means of self-fulfillment and of, you know, participating in society, of meeting people. Work would not be an onerous thing. You would control your own workplace democratically and the working hours would not be long. Uh, you'd have plenty of free time. And therefore also, because of this, because with the employment of most advanced technology in a rational way, there would be this superabundance available as well, which again, you have to say the technology today exists in China as well as in Britain and other places to deliver such goods for everybody. Uh, then you can, you know, have two each according to their needs. In other words, people would, you know, people with bigger families or other needs would have larger homes, you know, uh, not because of the amount of hours that they had worked or because of their status or anything, but simply because that's what they need. And that the, the sort of tensions that we associate, or we think of that that might bring about, in other words, the jealousies and things, wouldn't be there because the everybody would, there would be more than enough for everybody, right? Um, that is what communism means. So if China were a communist society now, then what you would have is no state apparatus. You wouldn't have any rich and poor. Uh, the working week would be greatly reduced, uh, you know, and there's many other things we could say, but those would be the, the fundamental points. And is that what we see in China? Well, cer certainly not. I mean, there's enormous inequality. It's actually one of the most unequal countries in the world. So you have, you know, many billionaires, for example, uh, as well as grinding poverty. Um, you have not just poverty in the countryside, but the working class, layers of the working class are very poor. They don't get their wages on time frequently to the extent that they, they, you know, they, they go on strike in increasing numbers. You have, you know, particularly migrant workers. There's a kind of two tier workforce, which is a, you know, a very striking example of alienation, which is a typical feature of capitalism in which, uh, you know, workers are divided amongst themselves and you have, yeah, your migrant workers who have fewer rights. Uh, you, you have, to, to say the least, you have a very power. you don't have the state withering away, you have a very, very powerful state, uh, which is getting stronger. For example, not only is it spending more on its military, uh, which you could, you could justify by saying, well, it's got America there, but it, it spends more increase, it spends more on internal security than it does on its external military, if you like. In other words, to police its own population. So this is a, a very powerful state apparatus indeed. And if we understand the purpose of the state is for the ruling class to repress another class. And if we do have a ruling class in China, which we, we do, of course, we've got billionaires, very, very rich people indeed, um, then what what is the state doing? Uh, what, and why is there a need for such a powerful state apparatus, increasingly powerful? Clearly, it's there to repress the working class, to hold them into line so that profits keep on flowing. Um, and I would argue it's pretty indisputable that that is the case. So... It isn't a communist society and it doesn't appear to be moving in the direction of communism. Well, some would say that China may not be communist today or may not have achieved full communism today, but it's harnessing the productive potential of capitalism. It uses that powerful state basically to hold its billionaires on a leash in order to develop the economy so that it can challenge particularly American imperialism on the world stage and ultimately build socialism and build communism. So would you say that China is at least building towards communism? No, because the growth in inequality is ever on the rise, because these billionaires that allegedly are on the leash 
you know, are members of the Chinese Communist Party. They're often leading members of it. Uh, the Chinese, you know, National Congress, the equivalent of the Parliament, has got more billionaires in it and far richer billionaires than even the American version. In fact, um, Xi Jinping, we we get this picture of Xi Jinping in the West as this kind of, uh, you know, populist figure who rails against the rich, um, and you know, is, is very much likes the sort of at least the imagery of communism. Uh, but also, he says things which don't get reported here. For example. Uh, earlier this year, he talked about um, how the private economy is an important, and I quote, an important force for long-term rule by our party. And he described entrepreneurs as our own people. Now, it is true that, um, for example, I mean, the obvious comparison, if you wanted to, to make the case that you you said people make, Joe, the obvious comparison would be the new economic policy that the Bolsheviks uh, had in the 1920s, when they allowed elements of capitalism to exist, they, uh, you know, allowed the peasantry, for example, to accumulate profits, to sell on the market, because they needed to make that concession. And yes, it did help them build up the economy a bit. Um, but that, there's a number of things. First of all, that was always understood as a strictly temporary concession, uh, and a step backwards. It was not seen as a long term thing. And as a, a in fact, they understood very well there were huge dangers of it, um, uh, that the, the, the capitalist elements would basically take over uh, and would maybe carry out a counter-revolution or would just sort of begin to control the party. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that they, they, yeah, this was a huge step backwards, fraught with danger, essentially. But the other, the other important point was that the only reason that this was viable for a time was because the, the the communist party was in the hands of the working class and of revolutionaries and you had workers control which could control that you do not have that in china in fact the state apparatus is in the hands of the rich uh, they are themselves billionaires they there's they have no capacity to sort of control these billionaires on behalf of the workers because they are themselves part of that that class and they have no interest in doing so we can go into plenty of examples uh, about that so it's not moving in that direction at all in fact inequality is growing um the outlook of the you know the leading members of the communist party are essentially that that the market works the market is very successful at making what they're interested in is, is their own wealth but also in china being a very very powerful country and that's how they see it they see that the market delivers the goods um and therefore we have to use it for that end there's no sign of a withering away of or, or, and also we should say that today china is an advanced or relatively advanced capitalist country it has some extremely advanced technology some extremely advanced factories it has the world's biggest working class it is able to compete with the united states on key areas of technology it is more advanced than the United States in some areas, not overall probably, but it, you know it is in some areas of technology. It is, it is up there uh, with the with the world's most advanced countries. So it's you know it is by now by any Marxist standard ripe for working class power. Uh, the working class is clearly large enough to take power and run society in their own interests to plan the economy the, you know there's there, there is no need to harness capitalism for any further development to take place well we'll come back to this question of the chinese working class but just to come back on something that you mentioned about china becoming the second power on the world stage this incredibly powerful country which is challenging or even exceeding america on some points and in some areas is china not then at least an anti-imperialist force in the world isn't it at least offering support to oppressed and dominated countries in the so-called developing world is it not challenging the hegemony of american imperialism on the world stage is that not a good thing from a communist point of view well, what china is doing is developing chinese imperialism in fact it's behaving as a classically imperialist country as lenin understood it Lenin describes imperialism not as a policy, you know, not as an idea which has taken hold for some reason, 
uh, but is instead uh, an outcome of the development of monopoly and finance capital and the fact that capital can it has outgrown the home market and needs to export itself needs to find basically new markets uh, cheaper labor elsewhere and uh, and of course therefore also comes into clashes with other imperialisms who are trying to do the same thing and it, it's really couldn't be much clearer that that is what China is doing. You have, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which is, you know, and, and, and they're trying to develop alternatives to the World Bank, like with the Asia Infrastructure uh, Development Bank, uh, Investment Bank, sorry. And, um, uh, you know, they are exporting Chinese capital. And just to give a couple of clear examples, uh, there was the case, the, the relatively famous example recently of them giving loans to Sri Lanka to develop a port, which those loans could not re be repaid. And so China has just taken control of that port for 99 years because that was in the terms of the loans. A lot of countries are in massive amounts, particularly in Africa, massive amounts of debt to China. And China does not even d uh, offer this debt as a sort of... Um, non-market rates in other words it could still uh you know offer loans to developing countries with loan you know with interest but where in which the interest was much lower than the market rate which would still kind of be a capitalist thing to do if you like because you're still charging interest but it'd be you know a more sort of generous one in an attempt to win diplomatic allegiances perhaps but they're not even doing that they're known actually as very hard-nosed negotiators in which they offer their uh, their loans at, at market rates, you know, and that's leading to many, many countries, particularly in Africa, uh, falling into debt distress in relation to China. It's causing big problems with resolving in debt, heavily indebted problems of heavily indebted countries in much of the world because there's a clash between, you know, Western lenders and Chinese lenders, and that makes it very difficult to sort out this. But one other example I'll give is with with uh, Laos, where Ch you know China has, if you like, an quite a classically imperial relationship in relation to, to Laos as well as a few other countries in the region like Cambodia and it is um, developing you know a railway line or has developed I believe a railway line into Laos like a high speed one and uh, it's you know uh, the the, com the companies performing you know carrying out this work are Chinese companies they employ Chinese labor and you have uh, effectively a concession, a classic, like a just like British Britain used to have within Shanghai, where there was areas where Chinese couldn't go. There is a there are parts of cities um, in Laos which cater to the Chinese workers, it, where, in which there are Chinese police. There's Chinese security, uh, which boss around the local security, tell them where to go, tell them what to do, effectively enforce Chinese law, and it's all obviously on the terms of Chinese interests, so that for, for these Chinese companies to continue making a profit out of Laos, it couldn't really be much clearer that it is acting in an imperialist uh, manner. So yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging America, but only from the point of view of being a rival imperialist power. How do we build communism? Issue 43 of In Defense of Marxism, the IMT's theoretical magazine, is out now. Link in the description. And it aims to answer this question. There's a piece on the trials and tribulations of building the planned economy in the Soviet Republic, an article on the revolution in Soviet theatre, and another on the tragic lessons of the working class's defeat in Germany in 1923. Pick up your issue today. But is China not at least led by a communist party? Does that not mean something? Well, we can't be so uh, uh, silly as to be uh, dumbfounded by labels. I mean, it's a it's a name. Uh, that doesn't mean you know the, the British Labour Party is called the Labour Party. It does not, <laughs> as we all know, its its leadership does not represent the interests of Labour. Um, it's yeah. It, it, the Chinese, first of all, um, to uh, let's go back to what we were talking about communism, where we said that well, communism means the withering away of the state and of class distinctions, and of course, for this to be when before you have communism in Marxist theory, you, you have the dictatorship of the proletariat. This is a transitional. Uh, society, a transitional phase in which you don't yet, you haven't yet laid the economic basis for full communism, but uh, you are doing so. You're beginning to lay that basis. To do that, you need to have uh, the, you need to have workers' control. 
uh, you need to have, you know, the state needs to be in the hands of the working class. In fact, um, Engels and Lenin called it a semi-state. The, the state that would be established almost isn't even a state because it's in the hands of the majority for the first time. And Lenin actually stipulated four rules for that. And that it would mean, for example, the right of recall. So all officials in this worker state could be removed at any time democratically. You wouldn't even have to you know, wait for the term limit to be up. You'd have a complete rotation of all administrative tasks. So there were no specialists. In other words, no privileged bureaucracy. All workers would be involved in managing their own workplaces and communities. We'd have, you know, no one being paid any more than the wage of a skilled worker. So there wouldn't be any privilege in the state, uh, in this worker state. It would just be people on, on, you know, there'd be no careerism essentially because it would just offer you the same livelihood as being a normal worker. Um, and it, clearly you don't see that in China today uh, at all. And anyway, this 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 state under under the control of the working class it would therefore always be in the process of, of disappearing because it's you know it's it almost isn't a state it's just something in the hands of everybody it's not a distinct privileged kind of uh, strata of society uh, and and to do this you also would have to have certain other provisions you'd have to have you know freedom of speech for the working class you'd have to have the right for workers to criticize to participate democratically to elect different people if you've got the right of recall which lenin stipulated for example that obviously implies the freedom of workers to choose who their representatives are and to remove them and to you know that means that freedom of speech it means freedom of criticism etc um, which you very obviously do not have uh, in China today, right? That the, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese state does not function in this way. They call it the, you know, the Western sort of liberals call it the, um, the party state. And in their mind, the party controls the state, which they see as a bad thing. Uh, in reality, what it is, is it's not a party at all. It's, it's a wing of the state. Uh, the, you know, and, and why do we say that? It's because the Chinese Communist Party is, of course, an absolutely huge organization. Um, but it is, there's no, you can't join the Chinese Communist Party and start electing in different people. You don't have the freedom. You know, I talked about the right of recall. You don't have the freedom to criticize. Um, and, work, you know, workers don't have the freedom to organize. How can it be a workers' party? A Communist Party obviously would be a workers' party. How can it be a workers' party if workers do not have the freedom to organize and to express their opinion and to elect different leaders um, so actually it's it's a means for the state to control the working class and to control society um, and uh, I mean if you like I could give you know a, a very clear example of this I mean obviously there's a vast number of such examples which I won't bore the listeners with I'll just f focus on one a well-known example of uh, in 2018 so under Xi Jinping's leadership this is there was a, a dispute uh, in the uh, a company called the JASIC Technology Company, in which basically workers tried to form a union and go on strike because of low pay, poor working conditions, etc. And uh, the company fired the workers for doing so. Now, if this was, as you said, a worker state that was merely using bits of capitalism, using the sort of profit motive of capitalism, but strictly under the control of a workers' party, uh, and it was just using that to sort of boost the economy to get more rapid growth right before you can actually rationally plan the whole thing. If that were the case, then you would always side with workers here. You know, OK, you would allow for companies to exist and to make profits and to, to employ workers. But these would be under the control of the working class, of the trade unions. Um, and, you know, you'd have something almost a little bit like what you used to have in the 1970s in Britain in some cases where you had a closed shop where the workers could have control over hiring and firing, for example. And you did have that in Britain. So if you had that in Britain in the 70s, at the very least you would have that in China under the Chinese Communist Party. But what, did, what was the reaction of the Chinese Communist Party and the state apparatus to the company firing the workers who tried to form a union? Um, well, it's... Not only did the police raid the apartments of the workers, but also of the students. There were students who, in the Marxist society in Beijing University, or in, I forget the name of the university, but it's in Beijing. Uh, there was a Marxist society there, uh, and it was in solidarity with these workers. And again, you would have thought, okay, these are young Marxist students. 
this is a Marxist party, allegedly. Surely, if anything, they'd be in that Marxist, but they'd be in the Communist Party, and the Communist Party would help them. But actually, it, they, they, they raided the apartments of both these workers and of the leading student activists. They detained about 50 people. And as they were detained, these people were singing the Internationale. So these are clearly young communists, you know, revolutionaries. Uh, but they were arrested for doing so. Um, and the police then went on raids throughout the country, arresting a number of students and workers all over the country. Um, and uh, many of these activists went missing. In fact, some of them have still not returned, I believe. Um, and, then, and then the Marxist society at the university was was restructured, uh, changed, basically. The old leadership was kicked out uh, under the pressure of the state. Um, you know, this and this is a typical thing, right, that strikes, of course, strikes do happen in China. It's very hard to stop strikes. And to a certain extent, they, they, they have a policy of allowing them to happen locally if they are strictly local for a short while as a means of letting off steam. But in general, clearly, there is no, <laughs> there's no freedom to organize a, a nationwide trade union at all. There's no freedom to organize strike activity in any serious way, as this example shows. And there's, you know, millions of other examples of, of, of striking workers and of, of, of young people protesting against inequality and justice, being arrested and uh, being thrown in jail, being treated extremely harshly. Uh, that's That's the reality of it. And so far from a workers' party sort of allowing elements of capitalism temporarily, but keeping that under the watchful eye of a working class so that the excesses of capitalism are not too much and so that eventually the working class can then overcome capitalism entirely. You have a, a state apparatus which is clearly repressing working class initiative on behalf of the bosses to keep profits flowing, essentially. That is, that is in a nutshell, what, is, what the, the Communist Party is doing. Hmm. That's a pretty comprehensive nutshell, so I think I'll move on to the final thing that I wanted to ask you. And it's something that I'm sure communists, revolutionaries listening to this will be asking themselves, which is, well, um, you guys say that China is not communist, it's not building communism, the Communist Party is not really a communist party. So what do we really want in China? What do we say as as the IMT? Um, as as communists, as Trotskyists, what do we want for China? Well, we want the, the working class of China, which is the biggest working class in the world, very, very powerful, at least potentially. We want them uh, to to fight for their own interests. And that would have to mean fighting for the overthrow of the regime that you have in China. And I think the potential for that is there. You, you know, it's it's impossible to judge when things are going to happen, but that you had last year, at the end of last year, it's so almost a year ago, a wave of student protests or young people protesting against the lockdowns and the repressive measures associated with them. Nobody could anticipate that. It more or less just happened overnight. And that's obviously because you have a very repressive regime that makes it very, very difficult to organize. And then you can suddenly have these explosions of anger so we anticipate a movement of the Chinese working class, which I think knows its own strength to a certain extent. It realizes its size. It realizes, you know, that they are responsible for the wealth of China. And I think a lot of Chinese workers see the wealth at the top, mm. which they see as like kind of ill-gotten gains, if you like. And they see it as, they see the, a lot of them see the Communist Party as having betrayed Mao right. and having betrayed it, the, 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 the heritage of the revolution. You have that as quite a significant consciousness. At the moment, you now have a huge rise in youth unemployment. At the last count, it had already gone up to over 20%, and then they stopped counting, which tells you that it's gone up. It's very significant. I mean, there's a big, big crisis of young people, of the consciousness of young people in China. There's real discontent there, a sense of, you know, we've worked hard and our parents have worked hard incredibly hard to, and now China is this wealthy powerful country and we're not seeing any of it and we've all gone through university there's a huge increase in the number of university educated young people and uh, and they have this sense you know we've sacrificed so much and we can't even get a home of course you got this huge crisis in in the housing sector right um, which is also an example of, of the fact that it's a capitalist economy and we should have I should have mentioned this earlier. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, a motor force for the development of this consciousness 
is precisely that if you play by capitalist rules, you end up with capitalist crises. Yeah. And China's growth is slowing, its unemployment is increasing, and this catastrophe around Evergrande, and more generally in the housing market, which is really one of the main, if not the main motor force of the Chinese economy, mm-hmm. um, it's classic evidence of capitalist crisis. Yeah, and you know regime no matter how powerful no matter how much it intervenes in the economy can avoid capitalist crisis if the fundamentals of the economy are capitalist which they are and uh, and you can see that happening in real time they're trying to you know and for years they've been trying to sort of plug the gaps and roll over debts because there's a huge amount of debts in china and a lot of it is sort of hidden debt and they know that this a lot of this debt is unsustainable. A lot of it are bad, you know, bad debts, as they call them. In other words, they won't be repaid uh, because the profits haven't been made. Um, and that is, you know, that means that there's there is a looming realization in the economy, or it's beginning to be realized uh, that there's a huge amount of fictitious capital, and a crisis basically uh, is ensuing. But you can see in real time that the state is trying to to intervene a bit, you know, not fundamentally differently to how they did after 2008 in the West, where they, you know, nationalized the banks and they basically, you know, they nationalized the losses and privatized the profits in an attempt to keep capitalism afloat. It's not fundamentally different to that, but the Chinese state has a few more levers, really, because, for example, the um, the fundamentals of the banking system are in state hands already, for example. So they, you know, they're doing... They're doing that, but they can't stop it. They can delay, they can slow it, they can slightly alter the way in which the crisis unfolds. But the, the because because they are using capitalism to boost the economy, i.e. the profit motive, then obviously that means that the economy is run on that typically irrational basis. In other words, the boom and bust cycle, you know, investments being made and loans being made that are not actually profitable or won't yield the profit because the, the, because of the, the typical you know the features of, of capitalism that the working class you know is too exploited to buy back all of the um all of the goods that they produce essentially and of course china is also plugged into the world market massively which it does not control which has also you know been stagnating and in crisis for more than a decade so there's a, a shortage of demand for Chinese goods, but then they're, they're trying to sort of constantly increase production uh, with the profit motive. And that's a, that's a contradiction. And you cannot get away from that whilst remaining within capitalism. Um, and if you roll over the loans, if the state says, well, don't pay back those loans right now, you know, uh, or don't demand those loans get paid back to you right now, because if you do, then there will just be a financial crisis. But those loans are still going to have to be paid back eventually. Um, if they're not, if you just cancel all the loans, then in turn you have another financial crisis because the whole financial system is revealed to be unsound. There's no way of getting around that as well. Um, and that means that you have to say the future for China is not going to be like the past. You know, you've had 30 or so years of unprecedented stability uh, based upon a booming economy. Uh, and that has come to an end. Also, the era of globalization that that was based upon has also come to an end very clearly uh so the future is going to be very unstable from for economic reasons also of course for geopolitical reasons with the clash clash with american imperialism which is very significant it's really the defining character of the world today so you know china's future will be very unstable in comparison to the past and the chinese regime has based itself on the fact that it delivers the goods at the end of the day whatever you think about the regime it's lifting people out of poverty. It's it's improving people's lives, and that's that's how they sort of sell themselves, if you like. Well, that's coming to an end. That means an era of profound instability. Of and we can see that in the consciousness of the youth today. There's many signs of it. There's many many signs of discontent in the youth. It's quite widely known that that's the case. I mean, how could it not be with that huge rise in unemployment? Uh, so we can expect big big movements to take place splits in the in the in the ruling class perhaps and there's many signs of that already with xi jinping and the removal of certain ministers uh, without explanation and with, with those cracks appearing you can also expect to see that the working class to take advantage of that right uh, to take advantage of the of the sort of weakness at the top to go on strike even more forcefully potentially for a, a national movement of strikes to appear potentially we don't know exactly what form it would take but 
the the there will be it sooner or later there will be a mass movement from below and that will be led by the working class and as as communists we must support that we must give our full support to any movement of the chinese working class uh, and and uh, extend them our solidarity in their fight for their emancipation hmm. and when the giant of the chinese working class does begin to move as i know you're fond of saying it will shake the earth of course it's the biggest working class in the world how, how could it not it will change the world well thank you so much daniel that was a really interesting discussion and if anybody is interested in some longer analyses of our view of the Chinese Revolution or the state of China today, then I will link some articles in the description of this episode. So that's it for this week. We'll see you again soon.